gun culture has an issue with resentment. For many years, the paradigm that we've lived in has been one against the idea of gatekeeping. And I have even produced a podcast episode on in defense of that very subject. And gatekeeping as it stands tends to look like the easy response whenever anyone finds out that they're not welcome in some community. Gatekeeping extends its ways out into our culture as we hear a never-ending line of complaints against people who are not letting others in. But gatekeeping was the paradigm six or seven years ago. Gatekeeping was in its height during the early wars of the or early times in the global war of terror, where the artificial, uh, let's just say, hero worship of the veteran was at its peak. You saw the boomer generation. You saw these people who observed movies that depicted at people like Mac V. Sog, the Delta Force things, anything of that community. And they elevated these people onto a platform which eventually trickled down through the culture and through the community as people sought after new forms of identity and elitism. And it served its purpose. The common soldier was dri driven to become better. They had people to look up to. I, when I was in Ranger Battalion, could always look up to CAG or Delta Force and say, hey, look, those guys are solving this problem this way. Maybe we should learn it too. One day I'll be a big boy and I'll go to the unit. But the problem with gatekeeping alone and what, ha it, what we've run into is that the paradigm certainly has shifted. If you look out into gun culture as well, if you look out into what we call our community, certainly the biggest players or many of our, our representatives in this case are not just special operations veterans. They're business owners, competition shooters, artists, comedians, culture warriors, and average citizens, even, as the joke goes, dirty civilians. And what is the flip side of the elitism that is represented in, or uh, what, is, what is the opposite of the, well, not even the opposite, what is the other side of the coin that we see when we talk about the elitism that's represented in gatekeeping? It's a term that's become so popular lately. It's resentment. You find it in political discourse. You find it in culture war conversations. You find it on the internet. But at, to this day, we as gun culture have looked at the problem of gatekeeping and collectively, communally, accidentally, intentionally, and of our own accord, individually addressed the problems that are inside. We find in our small groups of friends anyone who says, hey, you can't know this because you're not what I am. We find that unappealing. If there's an Overton window shift, it's in, gu in gun culture. The Overton window shift has moved away from elitism towards a commonality of rights. But that is also given grounds for what happens when you live in the age after revolutions. Because the age of revolutions, which was described in the late 1800s or the 1800s into the, and followed into the 1900s and perhaps continues to this day, is an era where the normal hierarchy is inverted. I am not the originator of this metaphor. I think it was Tim Poole who said it first, and I heard it from him a while ago, years ago, is when you take a pyramid and you flip it upside down, you still get a pyramid, although it's just more chaotic. Another example of this that we can identify in history is the French Revolution. The people who brought legitimate grievances against their government instituted a revolt through the use of force, including tools like the guillotine or the storming of the Bastille, and as a result, did they gain a glorious egalitarian empire? No. Their country did not become more free immediately. Instead, the reign of terror happened, and then Napoleon came in. The problem with revolution is that people become so dissatisfied with their current way of living that they believe simply to tear it down would, to make, would, be, would be enough to make their lives better, but they leave nothing in its replacement. 
This can happen on the individual level with an ideology, a belief system, or a metaphysic, as it is said, or it can happen in a massive scale. Communities will bind together in opposition to their rulers, overthrow the tyranny, and institute in its stead a new form. In our best and most idealized examples, we see something like the American Revolution, which, despite all of its struggles and challenges that it faced during and immediately after, at least uh, produced a country that, as it still stands, functioned for a while, if not into today. The difference between the French and, Re and the French and American revolutions is a common talking point amongst academic historians and those of us who are engaged in the study of history and time and the study of philosophy and culture, even though we do not exist within the academic environment. And the difference, the contrast between the American Revolution and the French Revolution is that at least for a while, the American Constitution stuck. You could say in American Marvel language, they stuck the landing. And the French certainly didn't, because instead of gaining some sort of liberty, equality, and fraternity, they gained the reign of terror, led by one Robespierre, as well as the will of the mob. They became so democratically emphatic about their institutions that they cut off the heads of anyone who opposed their majority rule. It wasn't so universal. You know I'm being a little hyperbolic in this. But the problem that we see here in this case is that resentment itself is not a long-term strategy. Not only is it not a long-term strategy, it is an immoral foundation upon which to build your own ideology as well as society. We have seen resentment take place in examples outside of gun culture, some of them being the ethnically motivated conflicts that exist in the United States when a population, which is called, you know, the black population, went from a bad situation, an oppressed situation of being a slave population or majority slave population to second class citizens, which was an upgrade, but by no means serving up to the level of the Constitution. But when they, as it's claimed, gained some form of equality or equality with society, had already gone so far as to sacrifice any identity and culture on the altar of the anti-culture. Today, we still see the fires burning of resentment in people who, though rightly wronged, or though rightly understood as wronged, have built their culture, community, and identity on resentment. The problem that you have then with resentment is when you get some sort of resolution, it often leaves the user, the, cons the one consumed by said resentment, with nothing left to live for. They are in hunger for a new fix, a new thing to be angry about, a new identity to place their life in. And if it's not racial disparity, maybe it's economic disparity. If it's not economic disparity, maybe it's simply that might should make right. And how this reflects within gun culture is that we've seen the hierarchy of the elitist fall, and for good reason. We've seen how that idea that a person could isolate the rights of others or isolate others from their rights on the basis of their having or not having government approval, having or not having certain experiences and training, we've seen that that is not the right way that we should organize our culture. In fact, what we need to do is we need to be specific about what we're challenging when we talk about the unethical application of gatekeeping instead of just using it as a cudgel to try to ad hominem our way through an argument. But I am not speaking anything new here. I'm not saying anything that has not been addressed before. I'm not the only person who has written about this, talked about this, or considered it. However, it is what has become the growing paradigm in our community. There is no one president, leader, lord, or overarching power that determines who is who in gun culture and where we stand as a whole, but rather, we have embraced a series of values, particularly ones about life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, 
one's responsibility to their family, one's responsibility to their community, and that climb goes upwards to the responsibility to their country. But in but if we leave that as undisturbed, we might we might create a fertile ground for which resentment to take place. The people who were downtrodden by the elitists of the past do not guarantee to become good leaders. They do not guarantee themselves to become good people to follow. In fact, we've seen this happen in American history as well, where if regardless of where you stand on the American first American Civil War, the American Civil War, the the general known as Grant, though he achieved some semblance of military victories, whether it was by his own skill and, and, and deserving capability or by the circumstances that were presented to him, when he went on to become a president, there certainly were some leadership challenges that he faced. It is not the case that every general makes a good president. It's not the case that every politician makes a good warlord. But what we face within this place as a community and as a culture is just because the dominating tyranny has lost its place within our culture doesn't mean that those who oppose it are themselves great virtuous leaders. And in, to cut away from the minutia of larger scale political philosophical conversation and look at it in the lives of ourselves as individuals resentment plays a very specific role in the gun culture which instead of acknowledging and desiring to expand our capabilities and our communities decides to hold on to that bitterness which one may have legitimately identified from gatekeeping and use that as their identity the most clear example that I see this represented in gun culture is when people become angry or or inconsiderate, uh, not inconsiderate, they become angry or dissatisfied when something is created, some new product enters the, the culture or some new concept enters the conversation that didn't have their specific circumstances in mind. This can come down to a training apparatus. This can come down to a tool. This can, can be defined by some sort of new culturally conversation driving element that arrives. And what you see when you see in resentment, when you see resentment in people, it often looks like that the identity of the individual is placed in attacking something specifically because it wasn't developed for them. Are you a hunter getting ready to go on a long distance, high altitude elk hunt? Well, why would somebody come out with a new laser? That doesn't do you any good. It's just appealing to somebody else's market. That person, the person who made that product, doesn't know what they're talking about when it comes to gun culture. This is what resentment looks like. It's when we look at something that was created with, to, with the solution, somebody else's solution in mind, and decide that because it wasn't made to address our specific problems, it is only a further example of gatekeeping. A challenge that we face as citizens in this environment is when companies produce products that are designed for what you might call the military industrial complex and use that as the fertile ground by which to build resentment against those companies. Now, certainly there is no shortage or there are examples where we can see people have overcharged for products because they want, they know that it will be bought. This is a criticism that can be brought against some of the hype culture. But then again, don't we believe that a person is entitled to the fruit of their labor? And if they decide to to spend their money on what they want that is their purview or does that right only go so far as we approve of the aesthetic and perspective of that purchase being made certainly we want to come together as a community and have like-minded goals and work together to expand not only our individual skill sets but our cultural capabilities and when people pursue things that are not in our specific alignment or our specific end goal, it can be frustrating. Wouldn't it be nice if we all had the exact same homestead lifestyle in mind? Maybe. It's not about diversity. It's not about cultural community or equity, even in that case. But resentment 
looks like the inverse version of gatekeeping when the person who was once kept out of the room now has some authority in the room and instead of living up to the example that they once claimed to desire they choose to now invert the table and use their newfound position to isolate people from their community a, a caricature simple example of this would be somebody who was not let into some gun group because they were not a veteran now has authority and when the and when other people approach them and want to have community with them they isolate those who have veteran experiences specifically because of resentment this is an issue that we see on different levels but instead of pointing out celebrities and individuals who have responsibility, it is important that we stop looking out there to find some boogeyman to fit the bill so we can feel good about our own position. Once again, I, res I return to some of the issues that we've seen in America at large when it comes to culture, and that would be the boogeyman of white supremacy. Anywhere you go within the certain within this community that ha, you know, they title themselves BLM or they title themselves multiple different things, the anti-racist community or whatever it is, in order all you need to do in order to gain power over something is to claim it as racist or white supremacist. This way, when there is crime in a part of the country that does not that is ninety percent African American or ninety percent black as described or self-described as black and yet there's some institution of crime or not institution there's some instigation of violence in that community of course they can still blame it on white supremacy even though white supremacy had nothing to do with it or it didn't cause the person to pick up the handgun and shoot at somebody else the the idea of the boogeyman of white supremacy can very quickly become the boogeyman of gun culture in the same way when we look at it or i'm sorry gatekeeping becomes that same boogeyman correction of the analogy we have seen in certain cultures of america the development of a boogeyman by resentful populations to label anything they don't like as let's just say the word racist Anything that they want power over, if they can convince enough people that it's a racist institution, then they can convince those people to give the complainer authority over the program. The same thing applies to gun culture. If we can convince enough people that, 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 that this element of the wing is considered gatekeeping, can we not then argue equally as powerful that that authority should be given from the accused gatekeeper to the now, what is it? representative resentful the, the the individual at bay i mean what how else do you want to address it this is the same issue that we face and so i want to address this problem and i want to address this problem not only from our own standpoint as individuals but i want to address it from our place in society if you have grown up in the gun culture and found yourself isolated from what you consider the gun culture itself because you do not fit the elitist definition then congratulations you've won that battle but are you going to carry that resentment on into the future is every veteran run organization going to be a shill is every single influencer just another guy greedy for money or are you recognizing that now that the door has been opened if that's even how you want to call it then there is a calling for you to bring something to the table the artificial barrier has been taken down, but the very real barriers to entry still exist. The real barriers, the natural barriers to entry in any community is participation, some semblance of humility, some bringing something to the table that people can circle their wagons around, have a conversation on, be, and edify their situation, bringing their lives up. Or are you simply bringing up old arguments and old problems that get in the way of those who are trying to join? Like we return to the analogy of the inverted pyramid, just because there are no more gatekeepers keeping us from having access to night vision or whatever, it doesn't mean that we are given free reign to let that resentment rule us. Let us consider then and turn our efforts towards addressing where there are inadequacies and inappropriate 
rules and regulations placed over us as a whole. It is not good that a man be restricted arbitrarily from having a, quote, short-barreled rifle, unquote, because somebody decided 100 years ago that it was too short to be safe in the hands of a citizen. These are things that we can look at and direct our attention towards and put effort into moving. Surely there are going to be people who call for unity, but that is not the same thing as achieving it. If you desire to get along with your fellow man, you can choose two roads, the abolition of value or the community built on values. Resentment destroys and gatekeeping isolates. Now we must narrowly walk the road between these two ditches, these two pitfalls, and choose how we treat one another within our community. Just as we see the problem with gatekeeping being an issue preventing otherwise legitimate participants from engaging in our culture, we will create the exact same monstrosity if we allow resentment to take place. The problem arises, though, that we cannot hold everybody accountable at the same time. We cannot go to somebody on the far side of the culture and pull them in and say, hey, stop doing this. This is resentment. But what we can do is address the influence that we have. Who are we in community with? Where do we, how do we operate our businesses? Where do we build our, where do we invest our time? If it, is, if it is something that is built in values, it has a much less likelihood of being built on resentment. So just because you see injustices in the world doesn't make you the infinite superhero to solve the problem. The identification of evil is not the same thing as solving it. And where we solve evil best is where we have control over that environment, and that environment starts with ourselves. We expand ever onwards, outwards of our own self-discipline and self-control and reflection of our own character. And so as gun culture goes forward, it's going to continuous, continually be faced with the challenge of resentment. And here's the warning. If we allow resentment to reign, gatekeeping will return. If you allow your, your place in the culture to be infested with angry, upset, moralist people in this sense, or who have built their identity on being gatekept from their environment, if, you, if we allow that to become the standard, it will recreate the circumstances that suggest the reinstitution of gatekeeping. You will find gatekeeping, isolation, and elitism easily justified in the face of an angry mob that says only give us more, even bread and circuses. That is the warning. But the encouragement is this. We exist as individuals. We recognize the illegitimacy of artificial institutions. We know and are capable of knowing and capable of making discernments best when we hold ourselves accountable with one another. That means me reaching across the vastness of the internet to somebody I have no influence over and spending hours of my time and months of my energy concocting these garbage arguments to yell at somebody just to say that they're an elitist isn't actually what we call holding people accountable. In order to hold each other accountable, we must develop relationships. But that perfectly aligns with where gun culture is going. We've recognized that the isolation and the atomization of the past is not the way to move forward. And as a result, we are seeking to find better ways to build community with one another. And that is part of the solution. We will see sub-communities and sub-sub-communities and small groups and this decentralization of American gun culture continue. But I have a quote for you, something that might be in a bit of encouragement on the subject. I have, start re I have recently started reading this book called The First Way of War by John Greenier. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. And I suppose if you're watching on, in, on, um, on YouTube, you can see the cover of the book now. But there is a line in his 
introductory thesis. Now, I'm, I, I'm, I think it's safe to say I'm not, I'm not absolutely certain, but this book reminds me of something that started as a dissertation and was eventually adapted into a book. Something that you see often with academics, and this is definitely an academic book. If you're interested in non-conventional warfare, so far as the introduction and the beginning of this book appear, if he can, if he keeps up with the promises made in the introduction, I think this will be a valuable book to have read and put on your shelf. Here is a quote from page six. The first way of war describes a small tradition that saw non-professional soldiers pursue unlimited objectives, often through irregular means. What he means, what he's talking about in the first way of war is what is it about war, the first ways of American war that make it so distinct. On the next page, he says this. As a this is a different, this is not. It's a different, it's disconnected by paragraph. So do not think this is one statement and then the following sentence. The, but uh, here's another line that stood out in just reading the introduction. As a result, Americans forged the ideal of the militarily self sufficient, sufficient citizen soldier in the ser service of a virtuous republic. What Greer, Gr uh, I'm sorry, Grenier is trying to appears to be trying to accomplish is he's trying to accomplish uh, he's trying to describe not only the spirit but the form and function of war fighting in early America. The subtitle is American War Making on the Frontier. Earlier he had earlier he has he says something like this. Quote This is on page 4 by the way. Quote Oh, this is a longer sentence. I only have the back end uh underlined. Let me read the whole thing. Americans, however, had served and fought outside professional military organizations for nearly 175 years before the army came into existence in 1775. And while many Americans found their way to both the British and United States armies, many more fought as Indian fighters as members of ad hoc organizations formed for specific operations and disbanded, and disbanded at their conclusion. So what Grenier is saying in this book, in his introduction, is that the history, the American history of warfare is or ought, can look like the citizen soldier who bands together with his community to solve a problem and then disband afterwards, allowing culture to continue onwards. And this isn't a bad ideal for us to continue to desire in America. This isn't a bad ideal for us to pursue. But what threatens that very idea is resentment. So if I have left you with something encouraging, I hope you leave a comment below if you're using YouTube or Rumble. If you're watching this on those two platforms, comment, share, please give me a hand on that one. And if you're listening on a podcasting platform, go ahead and leave us a review and share it. Because the only way that we're going to address, properly address the issue of resentment without producing the grounds for which this elitistic form of gatekeeping will return is to spread this kind of conversation and have it with one another. Gun culture is a beautiful thing in this country because it is something that we choose to participate in voluntarily. There is no enlistment into American citizenship if you are born here. We are all, there is no one there to prevent us from being a part of this community so long as we uphold the same values and seek after the same virtues. But those are not as complex and as, and, and as divided as we might think. Instead, if we want to live up to the spirit of our ancestors in this sense, we have only the responsibility before us. And if that has been a, if that has been a support to you, if you want to support this channel, you can head over to redactedculture.locals.com or stay tuned to Redacted LLC for upcoming releases. The Locals page is for those who want to engage in conversation with myself, and it's where I will be putting exclusive content, and then our merch store or our store itself where we keep up and we occasionally put out product like t-shirts and stickers and so forth, keeps the lights on and will eventually get me out of this garage as we continue on the road. With that be the, being the case, though, I want to thank you for listening, so go forth and conquer.